looking at this photograph, it's hard to think such a tale could ever take place. It wasn't one worth telling, at least not for those who couldn't handle an inkling of wanton, innocent bloodshed. Yet, here you are. Hey, it's a game that I've previously mentioned before on this channel. In all reality, the reason for why I'm covering Max Payne is solely because I had a hankering for it. There's something about third-person shooters that aspire to be more than just knee-high shooting galleries I'll always lap up. Perhaps in the near future I'll cover Vanquish or Binary Domain or Alice, but then I truly would be chasing trends at that point, as I completely forget that it was the 20th anniversary for this game and Devil May Cry. Those who don't remember history are doomed to repeat the past. But what about someone who still lives in it? What then? For us to begin, we must travel across the pond to a little country called Finland, home to such majesties like Ludwig Borga and the fartiest anthem you've ever heard. The court is still out determining if it's worse than the Michigan fight song. Imagine that rivalry. Also, no, you ain't getting a my way meme on my part because I can't be arsed to make one. You think you're special, special you do. Finland from the Hulkamania era, 82 to 93, to the new generation, 93 to 97, had a burgeoning demo scene. Groups of friends or colleagues would produce what amounted to an interactive resume for usage on the various home computers at the time. Think 97's gang warfare, with each demo scene group sticking to a preferred OS and trying to one-up their rivals. One such troop was Future Crew, headed by a colorful ensemble of pseudonyms, like Seriously, one of the members of the group is named Skaven, their importance should not be understated. They came up with Second Reality, which pushed the limits of what you could do with computer graphics at the time. Imagine seeing this in 93 on Amiga or DOS. Yeah, Innovative doesn't even describe it well enough. While the group was firmly lodged in the indie scene of the time, parts of the team realized that creative chaos wouldn't lead to any commercial success. Per the words of Gregor Loden, the senior narrative designer for Remedy, in an interview for Complex, it's just row after row of everyone playing different music and everyone's hacking and everyone's just modding. It's ridiculous. Experimentation was fine, but there needed to be concrete results. Thus, inspired by the success of finished development, Developers Bloodhouse and Terror Mark, a sizable faction within the group, including Second Reality organizer Somali Sovahako and BBS operator Marcus Maki, split off to found Remedy Entertainment. And like with any young and hungry group, they started picking up like-minded individuals to get the success ball rolling. With a loose confederation, as Remedy writer Sam Lake describes the early days as, we were just making it up as we went, with a firmer comment from him going as far as saying that the team didn't even consider Remedy as a full-fledged company, they were working out of a founding member's basement at this time. The new company relied on a connection made during their future crew days. 
Apogee Software. That's a name that needs no introduction, though to specify at this point in time, around 1996, they were under their 3D Realms moniker. Remedy already had an idea for their first game, a racing title under the name High Speed, and though the concept was solid enough, Scott Miller, with his long history in the industry, suggested a few additions such as adding vehicular combat elements. Thus, Death Rally was Born. It is here where one of the most important events happens for Remedy, the hiring of Sam Lake. Death Rally still lacked a script, basic explanations telling the player how the game works. Petri Yavaletto, a founder for Remedy, suggested as per Sam Lake's words in a video for Ars Technica, the only person he knew who was writing, his childhood friend Sam Yarvey. Sam Lake, as he is professionally known, was studying at Helsinki University of Technology at the time, going deep into English lit, and jumped at the chance as it would allow him to flex his skills. Though he was only hired to fill out a few lines of text, Sam did more than that as when he was looking at one of the menus for Def Rally, he noticed a large black margin that wasn't being used for anything. Asking Petri if he could fill it up, Sand was met with a flippant, yeah, sure. Demoing the game for 3D Realms, the company signed a contract with Remedy, with Def Rally going on to be a solid hit. Fresh off of a success and wanting to keep them coming, Remedy started pitching ideas to 3D Realms. Three to be exact, another racing game, its name unknown as it wasn't picked, a space sim game that also wasn't picked, though it was said to have been like Descent Free Space, and an isometric shooter by the name of Dark Justice. Out of all the ideas, Miller went with the shooter, but he wanted changes before he threw any weight behind it. A decade in the industry had given Miller very specific ideas on how to build a marketable game, at least according to The Escapist. Popular at the time was that IDOS classic Tomb Raider, so Miller proposed that Dark Justice go full 3D like the biggest release of the day, Tomb Raider, only with a decent camera. Making the game in 3D wouldn't be a problem for the former members of Future Crew, they were used to coming up with their own engines. What did prove to be an annoyance though was Miller's insistence on what I will call the Duke Nukem strategy marketing the game and having its title being based on the main character. See Duke Nukem, Strider, or Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney. And it wasn't because Remedy didn't like that idea, trying to come up with the name was the irritating part. Many were thrown out, including Dick Justice, until the name Max Heat was settled upon out of sheer dejection. Oh, and a price tag of $20,000 for securing the trademarks. Then, out of the blue, someone at Remedy thought, Hey, what if his last name was Payne? That person probably got a raise seeing as the team immediately switched over to it, unbeknownst of what issue the name would get the company into later on. I've been making a lot of wrestling references in this section, and while that is normal for me anyway, though I do think I haven't made one in a while when it comes to these videos, there's an actual correlation here. See, in between the years of 93 to 94, Daryl Peterson worked for World Championship Wrestling under the name Max Payne. He would then later jump ship to the WWF as Man Mountain Rock, who OSW will tell you is the face of the New Generation era, and I can't argue with that. Peterson had created the persona in 1988, shifting from Max Payne to Max Payne, with the character hailing from Hell's Kitchen, New York, and having what could best be described as a neo-noir look. Citation needed. Perhaps seeing the success of Max Payne, spoiler warning, or wanting to protect his intellectual property, I can't say, I'm not Peterson, Daryl filed a $10 million lawsuit against Take Two Interactive, who, according to Desert News, had paid $10 million cash and nearly another 100000 in stocks for all intellectual property rights associated with the Max Payne brand, including all trademarks, copyrights, characters, and brand extensions such as cinema, television, and literary productions, Rockstar Games, 3D Realms, Gathering of Developers, and Remedy Entertainment. Making matters even Stranger, Peterson had apparently done voice work for Take-Two on a game called Rogue Trip Vacation 2012 and alleges that the company knew about his Max Payne persona, but there's a glaring issue with that. Rogue Trip has no affiliation with Take-Two or any of the companies listed above. Rogue was developed by Single Track and published by GT Interactive. Either Peterson confused the two as the same or willingly lied, I won't say which as again I'm not Daryl and I've learned my lesson with shoving my foot in my mouth. It doesn't matter anyway as the case was settled out of court. With the detour out of the way, Max Payne received the green light. In the early stages of development, i.e 
when the team was coming up with a name for the game, Petri had decided upon the base for what Max Payne would be built upon. John Woo. No game at the time had ever tried to simulate a shootout from one of Woo's movies, thus making that and the usage of slow motion during firefights borrowed from The Matrix the perfect selling point for Max Payne. Sam Lake seconded this idea, tailoring the character of Max as the typical Chandler-esque hard-boiled detective, then systematically destroying him. With ideas mostly in place, a reveal trailer was broadcasted to the world at E3 1998, where Remedy's second issue would become apparent. Budget. The old budget issue that puts most startup game companies and even games themselves into the ground. Resources were spread thin for development as Remedy had to make the game's engine, the Max FX engine as it's called. And my cat is literally jumping up on top of my desk and is right next to my microphone. I don't know if you can hear him or not. What's it, Jim? What's it, Jim? Don't lick me. Don't bite me. He's the he's the he's the only grasp of sanity I have in this in this movie theater. Don't bite me. Don't taste too well. Resources were spread thin for development, as Remedy had to make the game's engine, the Max FX engine as it is called, from the ground up, hire voice actors, landing James McAfee for Max Payne, and pay for a trip to New York with police escorts to fully capture the seedy underbelly of Max Payne's noir York City, leaving not a lot of room for art direction. In a move that would revolutionize games development, Lake suggested using real-life photos as textures, giving us the now-famous and infamous Max Payne face. This this idea, as Lake recalls in the Remedy Entertainment documentary, was a hard debate inside the team because at that point still many of the artists saw that as cheating, an irony when you look at games development now. Likewise, he was the proponent for coming up with the game's iconic graphic novel styled cutscenes as they could be churned out quicker and cheaper in case the story needed to be edited and well, you'll see how they look as on the artistic level they're pretty great. Max Payne would see Remedy's first game on consoles, yet neither them nor 3D Realms had any experience with the PlayStation 2 or Xbox. Or Game Boy, but if you want more on that one, watch Minimi's video on it. Thus, they contacted the relatively new developer, Rockstar Games, and the rest is history. Max Payne would see release on July 23rd, 2001 on Windows, PlayStation 2, and Xbox with fervor re-releases to critical success, causing Take-Two, who was described as being in acquisition mode at the time, to purchase the rights for Max Payne. Ah, but I'm not done here. If you're playing one of the many console ports of Max Payne, Glad to know that you're into CBT, you can tune out for a few moments. For those that have the PC version of Max Payne, the version I played because it allows for quick saving, it doesn't work out of the box. You will need to install the Fix It All patch, which fixes the game's audio and any booting issues you might run into. There aren't any remastered versions of either Max Payne 1 or 2, so you have to do these workarounds for the time being. Oh yeah, there's also a bit of luck to this, as I will attest in the afterward. Yeah, the political campaign. I did mention that in the hint for the last video. I do not know the context of this, all I know is that one time on YouTube it recommended me this video as an ad. The leaked documents couldn't have been real. They read like a bad sci-fi story. If only I could still believe that. Our tale begins in media res, or as we will come to find out, the very end of the story. A man on a rooftop provides a monologue about how everyone is dead, his last bullet the resounding conclusion to the events we will see unfold. They were all dead. The final gunshot was an exclamation mark to everything that had led to this point. I released my finger from the trigger, and then it was over. Flashing back three years ago, we learned that Max Payne, detective boy scout of the NYPD and our protagonist, lost the American dream when a couple of Valkyr junkies butchered his wife and child. While seemingly random, a phone call deems this act purposeful. Something ugly had been tattooed on the wall, a map of things to come. It was a poison syringe, a magic tag full of diabolical meanings. Listen, someone's broken into my house. Call 911. Is this the pain residence? 
Yes, someone's broken into my house. They're still here. You have to- Good. I'm afraid I cannot help you. Who is this? Hello. Left with not but the cold feeling of despair, Max transfers over to the DEA, revenge the only consolation keeping him sane. Three years later, a break in the case comes forward. Jack Lupino, mob boss under the Punchinello crime family, is slinging the verdant devil. Working undercover, Max gets as close as he can, but a tip from fellow agent BB directs him to Roscoe Street Station for a meeting with another agent and Max's friend by the name of Alex. Something has come up with Lupino, but before Max can learn about what is going on, he gets dragged into a prolonged set of firefights against some Punchinello gangers, inadvertently placing himself in the midst of a bank robbery. Nicking a detonator from the scene of the crime, Max Jericho's his way to Alex just in time for the latter's execution. Robbery. A tunnel job straight to the Roscoe Bank vault through the old station wall. Is this why... This is Lupino's gig? This is Lupino's doing? Lupino's men? Really? You sure know how to pick a place? Can you get through? No, it's locked. We gotta get out of here. If it's Lapino, it's... Alex? Alex! There was nothing I could do. He was dead. I could tell by the empty, accusing stare of his eyes. Thoroughly up the roaring river with nary a rudder, Max heads to one of Lupino's dens, a cheap hotel, to directly confront the boss, but all he gets is more goons and bad news. His cover has been blown, and he's been framed for Alex's murder. Well, there's cheap mobster punks and tired-eyed prostitutes. I walk straight in, playing at Bogart, like I'd done a hundred times before. The place was run by a couple of murdering mobsters with shark smiles. The Finito Brothers. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the pain in the butt. Painted a max. You're killing me. Did you make that up yourselves, or you get some wino downstairs to come up with it? Don't answer that. A rhetorical question. I got something for the boss. Lupino around? That kind of depends on who's asking. A friend or a junk squad plan? The don't answer. It's one of them, uh, how do you put it, uh, rhetorical questions. Lupino ain't here, but he says bye. Lupino wasn't in his cheap hotel. Instead, I ran into the Finito brothers. With nothing left to lose, Max throws all caution to the wind, opting to track down Lupino's top underling to find where the wolf is hiding. In his effort, Max stops a Valkyr deal led by Rico Muerte, learns that a rival crime family, the Russian mob, is launching all-out war against the Puccinellos, and receives tips from a man by the name of Woden about the police on the fugitive's tail before finding Vinny Gogniti. Vinny got needy. Just the man I've been killing to see. Pain? Freaking fed! I knew from day one there was something screwy about you. What do you think you're doing? You're a freaking cop. You ain't got squat on us. You can't just come in here waving your peaks like it meant something. Yeah! Oh my god! Oh god, you shot me! Ah! You're dead, Pain! And what the hell are you waiting for, you apes? Kill him! Kill him! With pleasure, boss! Gagnini bailed. I made like Chow Yun fat. Employing the best tactics in police brutality, Max unearths Jack Lupino's location, Ragnarok. When Payne corners the mob boss, he sees how truly far gone the wolf is, the madman spouting heretical nonsense as if it was the Lord's Prayer. I had known there'd have to be a catch in it somewhere, and this one was the Empire State Building of catches. Lupino was pumped up and dying to go 15 rounds with a mutant alligator. And then he started this spooky monkey talk, straight from a bad dream. Mine. I have tasted the flesh of fallen angels. I've tasted the devil's green blood. It runs in my veins. I've seen beyond a world of skin, the architecture of blood and bone arrow. Death is coming. She is coming and hell follows with her. This is the twilight winter. I am ready to be her son. <laughs> her time is now, and all who stand in her way must die. <laughs> 
Not content with dealing in the green poison, Lupino has taken Valkyr himself, requiring Max to be thorough. Yet he wasn't enough in terms of his revenge as an assassin for hire, Mona Sachs arrives out of the blue to lament over Max's lowly views. Punchinello is the man behind the slaughter. A pretty face would make for a good team up in Max's eyes, but that's why you don't play the sap. Drugged by Mona, Max relives the American nightmare of three years ago, revealing that Max's wife Michelle might have accidentally exposed herself to a major government operation before waking up in another one. Michelle was working part-time in the district attorney's office. Her diary was open on today's entry, her handwriting all pretty curves. An army dossier found its way to my desk yesterday. Valhalla? Isn't that a Norse myth? Something about Vikings? I tried to tell Max about it, but he was busy, that cute frown on his brow. Guess it's nothing, just a mix-up at the courier service. From now on, I would always find time for her. It was a hollow promise. Too little, too late. Being slowly beaten to death by Canada's only worthwhile landmark. Good thing Niagara finds time to let the water fall, giving Max the opportunity to rethink his plan of attack and escape from the hotel he was dragged back to. Needing the firepower and leverage to take on Punchinello, Max runs an odd job for the Russians involving taking back a ship from them that has fallen under Punchinello control. Easily performing the task, Max draws Punchinello into a deal at the Maid Man's restaurant, but the Don turns it against our hero, almost roasting the walking husk alive. Almost only applies to horseshoes and hand grenades though, as Max survives enacting Plan B, storming Punchinello's mansion. What ensues is a lengthy standoff, ending with the Don's death, but not by Max's hand. Instead, black suits led by a mysterious woman were the ones to do the deed. Outgunned, Max is helpless as the woman doses him with Valkyr. Sooner or later, it was gonna catch up with you. Mr. Payne. It's time to show you the benefits of my brew. Be a good boy now. You'd find that Lady Luck was really a hooker. Ah! You were fresh out of cash. <laughs> Gentlemen, we're done here. Take me to Cold Steel. She had just given me an OD of Valkyr. I could feel green fire eating my brains. They turned to steam. They did a fade on me. I'd never had a chance. The witch had got me just as sure as if she put a gun to my head and pulled the trigger. The shadows rushed me. Bruised mugshot faces hungry for revenge. They knew my weak spots and closed in for the kill. The floor turned into a vortex of green blood. I fell. Miraculously, though, Max fights through the drug and hauntings it brings, tailing the woman to a black site where he learns the truth of Valkyr. It was a secret government project, Project Valhalla, meant to enhance infantry troops that lost funding. Top secret, Project Valhalla, U.S. Army, Yggdrasil Network. Valhalla, the otherworldly place in Norse mythology where the bravest heroes spent their afterlife feasting and fighting forever. Their wounds miraculously healed night after night. Valkyr, the maidens who chose the most courageous Viking warriors and carried them to Valhalla. 1991, the research objective is to create a chemical substance to enhance the stamina and morale of infantry troops. 1995, results unsatisfactory. Project canceled. Someone had decided to continue the sick experiment unauthorized. Project compromised. Data leak. Fix the damage by any means necessary. Security clearance red. Authorized by the project lead. Field test. Double the dosage for all the remaining test subjects. Observe and record the subject's behavior in an urban setting. The drop-off point was my old address in New Jersey. The file dated three years ago. Just when you thought you had reached the deepest depths of horror, it suddenly got worse. How to turn off that small voice inside your head that started to whisper that you should be glad that now, if not before, your revenge was justifiable on any conceivable moral scale. That small voice proved, beyond any doubt, that I was damned. 
The woman from earlier secretly kept the project going and will do anything to protect it at all costs, assassinating anyone who knows of the reality of it and self-destructing the black site, leaving Max without a trail to follow. Luckily, a call from BB puts Max back on the case, what with the backstabbing bastard wanting to smugly rub Max's failure in his face to disastrous results. Woden, at this point in time, decides to play his hand, directly meeting with Max to elucidate the cop on how far Valkyr runs. The original members of Project Valhalla, dubbed the Inner Circle, include both Woden and the woman. Horn, but while Woden and the rest of the Inner Circle saw how dangerous the drug was, Horn saw profit, using the Punchinellos to distribute Valkyr from the underbelly of New York, as she reigned from heaven as the CEO of the Asir Corporation. Blackmailing the inner circle through illicit sex tapes, their hands are tied behind their backs, thus they can't directly stop Horn. A deal is made between Max and Woden, the cop agreeing to kill Horn if Woden can pull strings to clear Max's name, just as Horn's forces storm the inner circle's HQ. Everyone is gunned down down Sans are cop, but as Max leaves to end this three-year revenge story, he spots Woden rising from the grave, not unlike an altered beast. With revenge just in sight, Max launches an all-out assault on a seer, reuniting with Mona, who opts to not kill Max, going against Horn's wishes and earning the assassin a bullet. One that causes her to disappear without a trace, confirming that Mona can match Max in the pain department. Mona, looking good. Max, we gotta stop meeting like this. It will be a cold day in hell before I let a narc cop stop me. Miss Sachs, do your job. Relax, Max. You're a nice guy. I don't kill nice guys. You're not bad yourself. It was different when Horn wanted Punchinello dead. To cut her ties to the Mafia, he deserved to die. The same goes with her. She's the bad guy here. Her sister was whispering to her in my favor. I knew the appetites of ghosts intimately. They hungered for revenge. Max! <gasps> no! A gunshot boomed and she fell down in slow motion. She was a nice girl, not really a stone cold killer. And now she was stone cold dead. Like religious fanatics or loyal samurai, Horn's private army was coming at me. When the elevator came back down, Mona was gone. There was a lot of blood, but no body. Something clicked for the final time. My mind had never been so clear, as if somewhere high above the storm clouds were already gone, cold stars blazing from the black skies. Face to face with Horn once again, Max has to chase her up to the roof, delivering his bloodstained conclusion by way of the building's antenna. Free of the ghosts tearing at his spirit, Max surrenders to the police, spotting Woden as he's put into a police car. Our tale ends with a winning smile, Max, trusting Woden but not knowing if he will uphold his part of the deal, content with his revenge. And then it was all over. The storm seemed to lose its frenzy. The ragged clouds gave way to the stars above. Max Payne, this is Deputy Chief Jim Bravora from the NYPD. We've got the building surrounded. Throw down your weapons and lie down with your hands behind your head. A bit closer to heaven. The cops' voices were distant and muted. Freeze! NYPD! Hold it right there! My ghosts released me from their haunting. Down below, New York City glittered like diamonds on black velvet. You gave us one hell of a ride. Take him down to central booking! You heard the man. Woden was there in the crowd, standing by the sidelines. It wouldn't be over till the man with the patch would say so. He'd say the right words. I knew he would. He'd better. Woden grinned smugly. It was the grin of a winner. That made two of us. What honestly makes the story of Max Payne is how simple it is. To hard boil it down, it's one undercover cop versus the world. 
An impossible task for any regular person, but time and time again, Max Payne proves to be more than that. With hunger fitting the dragon and hogger, Max won't stop until he has his revenge. An act that is entirely fruitless since it won't bring back his family, which both Max himself and Horn reference sans any sort of satisfaction Max can get from avenging his wife and daughter. And in doing so, Max essentially burns away his previous life of being a by-the-book cop. Hell, as soon as his wife and daughter were killed, Max took up Alex's offer to join the DEA just so he could find the bastards who committed the act. For another example, take when he's shaking down Gog Nitty. Vinny, who's already been shot full of holes before his interrogation, accuses Max of police brutality, causing the cop to brush off the statement, but his monologue notes that there's no glory in what he's doing. He ain't a hero, and Max is just following a single-minded process. It says a lot that Max basically shoots his way through the plot, never asking questions like why. It's because it isn't important to him. The standout scene of this is when he reaches Horn's personal computer. Instead of giving the old college try and hacking it to see just how deep Valkyr runs or how many pies Horn has stuck her hands into, Max destroys the computer, not bothering with understanding the complete picture. When providing his monologue for the action, Max throws in a joke about internet porno. That's how minuscule he cares. What's beautiful about this is that feeling can extend to the player. Yes, you can look at the more overt themes of the story, and I'll get to that, or the power plays that are going on, but there's nothing wrong with thinking like Max. Experimental drugs, government organizations, and crime families mean little to a 9mm kiss. We and Max aren't here to solve the mysteries of Valhalla or play cops and robbers. We're here to put a hag down. It's why we know so little about the other characters that live in the world. At most, the only considered fleshed out character is Alex, and that's because we see his connection to Max. Everyone else is a stepping stone in multiple senses of the word. They're all a blur, a footnote in one man's rampage. That tunnel vision directs Max, but could also prove to be dangerous. Not in the short-sighted angle that I've already covered, but in the lasting effects department. In his bid to take down Puncinello, Max does do some work for the Russian mob, helping them take back a freighter stuffed to the gills with the fully automatic catch of the day. Though Vlad does honor Max's request, helping him get at the dawn, it's obvious it's a means to an end. The Russians want their cut in New York, doing so to the Puncinello so they can take their place. With his ask-no-questions attitude, Max doesn't see the legitimate danger he might have put New York or even himself in. Maybe the Russians will prove to be even worse than the Puncinello or maybe they might see Max as a loose end. In that same vein, Woden is a complete mystery. We know he works for some shadowy organization, what with the cloak and dagger shit he does like calling Max at specific points in time to warn him about upcoming danger, but that does not make him a friend. It makes him an investor, his stock pain. This is a guy who beat death and reaped the benefits from others. He could be as bad as Horn, the only separation is that the two are on different sides of the conflict centered around pain. As it's stands, we don't know since our undercover cop never stops to think about what stage his sanguinary performance is taking place on. His bullet ballet rages on only for himself, but there are those that will take advantage of it. Max is a raging storm that will only subside when his quest is complete, almost like another gale that stops when the nightmare is over. The brutal blizzard buffeting New York is such a perfect metaphor for Max. Both are cold, one literal, the other metaphorical, and all-encompassing. The sub-30 degree temperature mimics Max's ruthless and unfeeling dealings with Valkyr. Likewise, Max is the fly in Horn's ointment, bogging down her plans like the weather for the people of New York. And like I've said, both end up settling after Horn is killed, Max growing a bit closer to heaven, ironically using the Asir Corporation catchphrase to describe the end of his journey. What a perfect way to both start and end the story. Opening up Max Payne with the unbeknownst death of Horn so that we can see how far Max traveled to see her put in the ground makes the heaven line a tad bit sweeter. Revenge, as I've said here and previously in the darkness, is a futility, but does it sure as hell feel good? I would end there, but that would be leaving out the whole Norse angle. In short, Max Payne, the way I look at it, is a retelling of Ragnarok, with the eponymous character taking on the roles of Vidar, God of Vengeance, and Thor. For a brief recap of the event, Ragnarok is the end times in Norse mythology. A great number of gods will see their deaths, and the world will be plunged into a watery coffin. Amongst the slain will be Odin, whose son Vidar will seek revenge for and will obtain by slaughtering the wolf Fenrir. Isn't that just the tale of Max Payne? I'll give a rundown. 
Alex is the Odin in this story. Initially, Max seeks out the wolf Lupino, or Fenrir, because he was the main suspect in the murder of Alex. Avenging his death, Max is told by Mona, the Freya stand-in, that Lupino was small-time. He really needs to go after the big fish, or serpent as he's hard monger, Punchinello. While the two don't directly fight, Max does end up collapsing after dealing with Punchinello just like Thor did after fighting the serpent. That leaves Horn as Surtur, seen as she handles the two Freyas that are Max's wife and Mona, and Bibi as Loki as he fights on Horn's side. It's ironic that Horn is the CEO of a company named Asir. The world being plunged into water has its correlation to the ice storm plunging New York into darkness. People will flee away from their villages, and while New York isn't entirely desolate, the only ones out on the streets are those that are waging an allegorical war. And at the end of Ragnarok, the world will go back to normal, just like how the storm dies down. I will say, I I haven't fully figured out the placements for every character using this view as I'm not too well versed in Norse myth, but I do like that the references are more than skin deep. My surroundings had become a macabre presentation on the biology of man, a twisted tribute to the horrors that would be haunting me. The Max FX engine hasn't aged particularly well, and this is with the Max Payne fix that ups the scaling. Models are quite polygonal and jagged, with faces, though photo scanned in as Max's writer Sam Lake, being odd textures on the heads of the characters. It creates this unintentional hilarity as seen with Max Payne's death face. It looks like he's trying to pass a BM or is on the couch with the chipmunks. There is charm to the faces though, I won't lie. Character design is pretty standard, but shoutouts to Max's wardrobe for being equal parts gaudy and iconic, like a low rent or skeevy version of Miami Vice. World design is going for realism and it does land the mark, but I will say the locales of Max Payne are not memorable with some lower quality quality texture work being the worst part. If you've seen the city of New York, congratulations, you've seen the world of Max Payne. The parts I just mentioned are the weakest aspects of Max Payne's presentation. Everything else is far above the pale that it's admittedly hard to cover the presentation in any meaningful way outside of saying it's good. Sound design is top notch in both grand scheme as weapons sound fantastic across the board and subtle. Enemies always have a death cry that plays when they are killed no matter what. It plays at full volume and is never muffled. That way, when you're shoot dodging or slowing down time, you can tell an enemy has been killed. Don't stop at him! This While music is sparse, what is there hits that level of melancholy triumph that fits the mood that the story is going for. The sad piano bars of the main theme and its various renditions are ingrained into my DNA, and while sure the other tracks aren't as good, they amplify the action as any good OST does. The king of this game is James McAfee, the voice of Max Payne. Delivering a performance so gravelly it filled countless school playgrounds, McAfee is the backbone of this game. Without his performance or Sam Lake's clever writing, this game would only be half as good. I can't do his voice work justice, so I'll let the man speak a couple of lines. That was three years ago. Everything ripped apart in a New York minute. The pills would hold the pain back for a while. The stress was getting to me. I'd made a mistake I'd never be able to fix. Pressure was too much. I'd sunk down to their level. It wasn't worth it. Nothing was. We come to you now live from the crime scene. Who is this? Right back at you. 
This is Deputy Chief Jim Bravora from the NYPD. You are to cease your criminal activities and surrender immediately. Sure thing, Jim. Me and the boys have been talking and everyone's real sorry. They'll never do it again. Who the hell is this? Being placed at the scene of a bank robbery wouldn't have tipped the odds in my favor. Collecting evidence had gotten old a few hundred bullets back. I was already so far past the point of no return, I couldn't even remember what it looked like when I had passed it. The word was out. A deadly virus released into the city's corrupt circulatory system. Something wicked this way comes. Max Payne at large. Turn around, walk away, blow town. That would have been the smart thing to do. Guess I wasn't that smart. As it turned out, the Russian had plenty of guts. One thing he could count on, you push a man too far and sooner or later he'd start pushing back. Vinny Gogniti was running scared. He could run, but with a bullet in his stomach like a broken bottle of Tabasco, he was quickly running out of time. He knew where his boss was, and I wanted to square things up with Jack Lupino. Gogniti would be moving fast. I don't know about angels, but it's fear that gives men wings. There was something disturbingly familiar about the letter before me. The handwriting was all pretty curves. You're in a graphic novel. The truth split my skull open, a glaring green light washing the lies away. All of my past was just fragmented still shots, words hanging in the air like balloons. I was in a graphic novel, funny as hell. It was the most horrible thing I could think of. It was a bad line in the prank call. Someone spouting insane babble, I couldn't make sense of it. But I had an overwhelming sense of deja vu, and the caller's voice sounded oddly familiar. There was something disturbingly familiar about the letter before me. The handwriting was all pretty curves. You're in a computer game, Max. The truth was a burning green crack through my brain. Weapon statistics hanging in the air, glimpsed out of the corner of my eye. Endless repetition of the act of shooting, time slowing down to show off my moves. The paranoid feel of someone controlling my every step. I was in a computer game. Funny as hell, it was the most horrible thing I could think of. Next to the printer was a neat stack of expensive paper. Hacking through Horn's computer would have unearthed files of criminal plans, strategies for world domination, spy helicopter reports, illegal wiretap recordings, internet porno, all of the above. Take your pick. I really didn't care anymore. I had seen too much of it already. It might be my favorite video game performance of all time. The cutscenes are the other standout part of the presentation, adopting a graphic novel style to tell a tale of revenge fitting for that of the crow. While the choice was for budgetary reasons, they add a lot of character to the story. It's as if we're reading a penny dreadful by the name of Max Payne. What little I knew about the game I was stepping into, of its gruesome gameplay I would soon engage with. Max Payne is a third-person shooter with an emphasis on Twitch-based shooting and punishing difficulty. Up front, I will talk about the second notion first, because if you want to play on the higher ones, you have to complete the game first. Sorry if you want to be shot up like a Chinese tea house from the get-go, you have to earn that, right? In total, there are four modes. Fugitive, Hard Boiled, Dead on Arrival, and New York Minute. Fugitive is the normal difficulty and what I use to complete the game, as my rules state that I must be able to beat a game bare minimum on its standard difficulty. There is some leeway with that rule, but I have yet to play a game for me to bust out that specialty book. Hard Boiled and Dead on Arrival up enemy health values while lowering maxes, as well as limit the amount of quick saves the player can make among other modifiers. New York Minute, on the other hand, turns the game into a speed run, with the player having to clear each level under a time limit. Max Payne, on the whole, is a linear game, with you being dropped into a level and being told to reach the end any means necessary. There are some side attractions in the form of platform forming in puzzles, but those are few and far between. Unless you want to call figuring out the various methods to murder the baddies in your way a puzzle. Make no mistake, even on the normal difficulty setting, enemies are dangerous. The key phrase for today is 
reaction time. Enemies in Max Payne aren't your typical third-person shooter goons. They have near-perfect accuracy and shoot on sight. Once alerted to Max's presence, they either take a defensive position to stall him out or rush aggressively to flush him out. Whether they carry a lowly Beretta or Paincore jackhammer, any and all enemies should be treated with care. Blundering into a room without caution is a death sentence. However, that's all you have to stress about when it comes to enemies. All that really changes for them are designs, health values, and weapons, with bosses only being beefed up regular grunts with names that may be flocked by henchmen. You, as in Max, on the other hand, are flimsy and have to contend with leading shots, but are highly mobile. While every other cop in New York was watching Police Academy, Payne was binging through John Woo's filmography and The Matrix. As such, Max has mastered the art of the shoot dodge and can slow down time, each having their own benefits. Shoot dodging fully reloads Max's currently equipped weapon and allows him to attack while taking an evasive action. To offset it, it has less defensive capabilities and has ending lag. Time slow, meanwhile, allows Max to react in real time while everyone else is slowed. This makes aiming shots easier and can help with dodging, but it's a massive drain on Max's time gauge. Pain can't just willy-nilly bend time forever. Located next to his health bar and painkiller's amount in the bottom left is the time gauge. He can't perform the shoot dodge or time slow if he doesn't have the prerequisite amount to do either. However, killing enemies earns him a little bit of time for these actions as well as ammo for the various guns he can use and painkillers. Before I get to those though, Max can also perform a regular dodge roll by jumping and moving in a direction other than forward. Though the purpose may seem pointless in comparison to the shoot dodge, the regular roll provides better defense for Max, throwing off enemy gunfire and generally rendering them confused enough for Max to either pop off a few shots or go into a shoot dodge without worrying about a reprisal. Using all three abilities to deal with scores of foes is the core of Max Payne's combat. To be finished with Max's movement options, he has near-perfect ground control as he can roll and shoot dodge in impossible ways, and air control, though jumping does have two states depending on whether Max is moving or not. There are not a lot of collectibles within New York City, the only two being painkillers and ammo. Painkillers are mostly found in medical cabinets, though some enemies have a tendency to drop them. When using a painkiller, it doesn't immediately heal Max's wounds, thus using them in a pinch is not advisable. Here's hoping that Max doesn't get addicted with the amount he has to down. Ammo on the other hand comes in two varieties ammo boxes, and dropped weapons. You can pick up ammo until the cows come home or the ammo cap is reached, but if you don't own the gun, you can't shoot the bullets. While most of the time you'll always find ammo or painkillers after a battle, looking around can yield some hidden goodies. Items can also be found in destructible objects, allowing you to see how bad the melee hit detection is in the game. Newsflash, this is an elements of style. Melee attacks will get you killed. That's why we have guns. Guns come in standard modern flavor from hand handguns to shotguns to fully automatic arms and even some unique types. Each gun has a different level of accuracy as well as other statistics such as bullet spread when shooting while dodging or moving. These aren't hit scan weapons either. Bullets are physical objects in the world that need to be accommodated for. Though you do have a tiny aiming dot, it's not one-to-one -one accurate with where your shot will go except for the Colt Commando or the Sniper Rifle. A shoot dodge can be wasted if you don't lead shots. However, headshots from any weapon are one-hit kills on everyone except for bosses. There are also explosive weapons in the form of the M79, grenades, and molotovs that act the same way. Death in Max Payne comes wicked fast, causing the player to restart from either the start of the level or from a quick save. Take caution with quick saves as a dubiously placed one can lead to an embarrassing Ouroboros. Throughout the adventures of Payne, Max might have to interact with objects such as levers or door controls. I point this out mostly for the doors because everyone closes automatically, regardless if it's a standard hinge or controlled by a panel. Max can't pull a hotline either. Lastly, some environmental hazards are in place such as fire or great heights. Though Max can take fall damage, his height threshold isn't high. A small drop can put the squeeze on Max, or more his shins really, so try to measure out your drops before you make them. Fire on the other hand is an instant kill. The humans of the Max Payne world descended from candles with how easily flames burn right through them. I can't complain however, seeing as the big chill puts me on ice. 
Any good left in me fell away of the remainder of my human skin, leaving only a festering sore as my body mass. If I'm going to start anywhere, I'll begin with the character of Max Payne. The pain in the butt. The hollowed out DEA agent with nothing to lose. He hits all the high notes when it comes to a gritty noir protagonist, from the suave efficiency when dealing with criminals to the verbose, flowery monologues that compartmentalize his thoughts and feelings. It's to such a great degree that I can't help but follow along with Payne's loquacious soliloquies during the cutscenes, not only because of James McAfee's superb delivery, but also because of how imaginative they are. From the clever usage of metaphors and similes to solid symbolism, Sam Lake proves how ingenious a writer he is. The amount of quotables from Max is so damn high that I wouldn't even be able to list them all out. What's so impressive about the writing for the character of Max Payne is that it never dips. From the first gunshot to the last, he maintains a high plateau that most video games wish they could. That first impression, Max on the roof of a seer proclaiming they're all dead, not only is a perfect way to hook the audience in, but demonstrates the type of character Max is. A determined rogue, nay, a spirit of vengeance with a score to settle. Compelling would be the best way to describe the character of Max Payne. Despite the overtly dark nature of the story, as this plot kicks off with the murders of a wife and child, Max Payne does take time to indulge in some comedic detours to lighten the mood. There's the crack at Niagara leading to a full-end walloping on Max's part, with additional monologue from him saying that pissing off the mobster was the smart thing to do. How about Vlad and his insistent need to reference crime movies like Godfather. All the enemy chatter falls into this category as well, with a lot of them passing the time either pointing out the clear inspirations for the game, the password is John Woo will always get me, or having small talk. The guards protecting Horn's security mainframe bring up how they have a family in a funny parallel to Max's life. The best example out of the entire game, however, is the second nightmare. Under the influence of V, Max's already fractured mind splinters even more like cracked pavement under a parade of people. To cope with the insanity and effects of the drug, Max's mind warns him that he's in both a video game and graphic novel. What makes me love the meta joke even more is that it doesn't detract from the story due to its framing. There's no, oh look at how bad this thing is, then the story proceeds to do the bad thing. Think Duke Nukem Forever and its Valve joke. Because Max is out of his mind while within it, the idea of being in a video game or graphic novel, especially with the cliche nature of the story, wouldn't be out of the question for his poison graphic gray matter to present. And seeing as I can't fit this anywhere else, the fact that the story is cliche is not a negative. Remedy was going for a playable hard boiled and they made it. Just because something isn't original doesn't mean it's bad or executed poorly. Yeah, but now I'm getting into the philosophy talk when I should be covering the gameplay. If Gungrave was the unstoppable version of a John Woo movie, Max Payne would be the reality. Or for another apt comparison, plain Max Payne is like being John McClane in Die Hard. One false step and you're dead, but you are heads and shoulders above everyone else when it comes to brain power. Gunfights aren't so much that as they are scrambles, frantically dodging bullets while laying down the heat hoping that the pain pills kick in. Time to kill is high on both sides, so even though Max is routinely outnumbered, he can never truly be outgunned. What's great about the gameplay is that it facilitates a few playstyles, from Devil May Care run and gun to the calm and collected turtle. It helps that Max's arsenal is so well-rounded. Has there been a better weapon loadout in a video game? Well, yeah, there's a little game called Doom, but each weapon in Max's armory has a purpose. The Berettas are admittedly weak and inaccurate, but they can stunlock enemies preventing them from engaging Max. The shotguns deal high damage up close, but have heavy drop-off at mid to long ranges. Shoot dodging with them can also be physical. Ingrams deal considerable damage at the cost of burning through their ammo, with enemies carrying the weapon posing a significant threat. Their spread is also the widest out of all the guns. And for as perfect as the Colt Commando is, the low clip size for an automatic weapon is its Achilles heel, needing clever usage of shoot dodging so it doesn't run out mid-fight. Outside of the end, when the game gifts the player what amounts to unlimited Colt Commando ammo, I was constantly switching what weapon I was using depending on the scenario. It adds to how the gunfights are more spur of the moment than tactical engagements. The time mechanics are the foundation of this, providing access to riskier forms of play for those who really want to do John Woo proud. Chaining together 
regular dodges into shoot dodging to take down a group is extremely satisfying, especially when the enemies have the drop on you. Using an example from my own footage, I had a rule that I would only quick save after cutscenes, long gameplay sequences, or a grenade trap. Under this rule, I quick saved at the worst time after confronting Vinny when he 6 3 guys on max. They start right in his grill, and me being a dumbass, I had a Molotov equipped. However, by using both dodges, I not only got out unharmed using one of the goons to take out a member of the trio, but mounted a counterattack by stun locking with the deagle. I felt like a damn action star pulling moves like that, which I must remind you is the point of the game. Keep in mind, I don't have a high skill level with these games. I can play them to completion, but I don't know all the pro tech associated with Max's moveset. Last, but certainly not least, the level of interactivity for the game is pretty crazy for something released in 2001. Max can flush toilets, purchase drinks from vending machines, and a whole bunch of other actions that mean little, but it's still neat that he can do so. Those regrettable actions that had led me to this point hung over my head like a rain cloud, a bad storm diluting all around me. Inversely, there isn't much I hate about the game. My only gripes with Max Payne are the platforming, which doesn't show up too often, and even then it's only one sequence that boils my blood in enemies armed with explosives. The platforming in Max Payne isn't the worst thing ever. It's basic and gets the job done, but Boy does it love having Max make tightrope walks. Max gets jittery around narrow ledges leading him to falling to his doom more often than not. While quick saving does mitigate this issue, the second nightmare sequence has the worst moment of this. While the first one can be cheesed as the entrance and exit are right next to each other, the Valkyr induced terror forces Max and the player to engage with a decidedly lengthy narrow platforming challenge. One that requires gauging height as well as Max will need to fall to find the exit and though the health bar is isn't on screen, Max still takes damage during this moment. It's probably the lowest point in the game from a plain standpoint. What truly makes me want to take a hit of V, however, are enemies armed with grenades. Hearing the ping of one might as well be a hypnotic trigger for me that induces overwhelming terror. Not only is the blast radius hard to judge, there's little damage fall off. Being at the center of the blast hurts about the same as being on the edge of its radius. Grenades deal enormous amounts of damage, basically a one-hit hit kill, factor in the enemy reaction time and the existence of grenade traps where you round a corner only for a grenade to be flung from somewhere off screen leads to a frustrating time. Yet I can't be too aggravated as quick saves are in play. An overall sense of hunger greeted me when I came out of the still blackness, one that I would abide by. Man, I'm really glad I went back to Max Payne. As I said at the start, I had a hankering for the game because of its fun gameplay, endearing main character, and fantastic presentation. But on this run with the game, I can safely say it's a masterpiece and might be one of the best third-person shooters I've ever played. Definitely go out of your way to play the PC version of this game. <laughs> Okay, for as short as these games are, I got into a Max Payne kick again and wanted to play all the games after finishing the first one. I had to do a fresh install for Max Payne 2, which is probably the most frustrating thing you can do for this version of the game. I had played 2 on PlayStation 2, and that's because there isn't a single patch that rectifies all the issues for Fall. As such, there are about 3 to 5 different solutions you can take, each with varying degrees of success. That's because no one really knows, or at least from what I gathered, what makes the game able to run. I still don't know how I was able to get it working, and I tried at least four of the five available remedies. One requires you to create a batch file, another is a widescreen plus boot up fix, while two others were focused on running the game in Windows 98 compatibility mode. I know the latter two didn't work, but I don't know if it was the batch file fix or the widescreen one as both are in my games folder. What's the oddity of this is that when I first applied both, neither worked. 
Since I was doing this late at night, I figured I'd take the L and worry about it in the morning. Maybe my friends on Discord could get some humor out of my mental taxation and I'd have a tale for my brother in the evening. However, as I lay in bed, I had the same flash of insight that Mandalore had when he was trying to get Empire Earth running. Booting my computer back up, I clicked on the game in my Steam library and started it from there. In my head, I knew it wasn't going to work and... Yet it did! Now, with the prospect of having a working Max Payne 2 not knowing if this was the act of a blue moon, I played the entirety of it through the night, opting for a nap in the middle of the day in between my two planned outings. What I'm trying to say is that I shouldn't have to jump through this many hoops to get a game working, especially one owned by Rockstar and Take Two. Oh right, they're too busy becoming the GTA company. This showing of Max Payne is over, but stay tuned for our next feature involving an unreliable narrator. Shoot dodging. Huh? And a president of the United States of America.